you heard, we've learned about um, the history of uh, the site at Texas A&M. We've learned about uh, broader San Antonio history. And um, in working with uh, Texas A&M, um, I was introduced to a young historian, Dr. Phyllis Baragon Getz. She's here. Um, and as Dr. Phyllis and I worked, um, uh, we were fortunate to come across a, a very good uh, student intern, um, Mariah Torres. Uh, Mariah apologizes, she's feeling, feeling under the weather. Um, and I wanted Mar Mariah to be here so that you can see the different uh, levels. I, I consider my work kind of practical application of history. Uh, Dr. Phyllis is an academician, and uh, Mariah is a student um, who's up and coming. Um, so that was the purpose of having this uh, group to, uh, to share with you this morning. Um, so there's quite a bit in here. Um, I won't be able to cover it in detail. I hope what it'll do is pique your interest and uh, we'll try to save time at the end for uh, question and answers. I, that, to me, that's the best part, uh, or the questions and answers. Um, so uh, let's start with the, the slides. And okay, we're off to a good start. Um, so my work with um, historic black settlements actually started um, in the 1970s, uh, 1975, when I was at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And I had a professor, his name was John Jackson. And he taught a class called The Built American Landscape. Uh, Professor Jackson talked about uh, European settlers. Um, he talked about uh, Native Americans. But the only thing he said about African Americans is that they were slaves. And sometimes they did some work on plantations. Um, there's a whole story um, in that. Um, after I graduated, Jackson and I continued to be friends. And uh, my wife, Rosalinda, and I, he lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it's just a blessing. We had the opportunity. We would fly out to Albuquerque, rent a car, and drive it over to Santa Fe. And we would sit in Jackson's kitchen <laughs> outside of uh, Santa Fe and talk about these things. And the result was that he began to pass my name on to folks, and uh, other people passed my name on. And I had a chance, I've had a chance to work on African American settlements across the United States. So the result is this outline that you see on the slide here. Um, and I did this to kind of organize myself. Um, so if you've seen one black settlement, you have not seen them all. Uh, in other words, there were market towns, there were rural villages, there were incorporated towns, there were enclaves, et cetera. And, and you can read the list and see from the slide, uh, Boley, Oklahoma, uh, uh, Buffalo, New York, uh, the slide, let's see, does it, oops. There, that's in Colorado. That's the Winks Panorama Lodge. That was the only black mountain resort um, before the, uh, World War II. And so folks would actually get on a train and travel from California or DC and go to Winks Panorama Lodge. Uh, one of the prominent visitors to Winks, for example, was the Harlem Renaissance writer Zora Neale Hurston. Okay, um, and so that was an, a black resort. There were black resorts in California, there were black resorts on the East Coast, a whole range of different kinds of, of settlements and communities. Um, I'm, I told you I'm gonna move forward here. So uh, before Martha called, um, uh, uh, Allison Elder, I don't know if any of you might know Allison, but Allison called and said that she had discovered her family was related to Samuel McCulloch. Samuel McCulloch, as you can read there on the slide, <clears throat> excuse me, he was born in 1810. Uh, he was mixed race. Uh, the important thing, or one of the important things is that Samuel was the first person black, white, brown, yellow, red, or otherwise, wounded in the Texas Revolution. Samuel is buried here in Bear County. Allison Elder and her family are descendants of Samuel McCulloch. So that means there are McCulloch descendants, just like Martha's a descendant of Asa Mitchell, here in Bear County. It turns out that, that um, Samuel's wound allowed him to uh, receive what they call a bounty, uh, payment in land for his service. 
And that land that Samuel uh, received is in the same neighborhood, believe it or not. It's on the south side of San Antonio, along the Medina River, in the same neighborhood as the H Asa Mitchell family. So my guess is that the Mitchells knew Samuel. Okay. Um, and here's, here are the photographs. You can see the, the uh, outline, the map outlines the McCulloch uh, land. He received uh, two-thirds of a league. And two-thirds of a league is, for you good Texas historians, is 2,952.26 acres. So all that land in red was Samuel's. And the highway line that you're looking at, that's I-35 headed to Laredo. So McCulloch's land straddled both sides of 35 and touched the Medina River up there at the north. And the image at the bottom right is the McCulloch Cemetery. So you can actually drive out to what's known as Man's Crossing and see uh, the McCulloch Cemetery and Samuel's grave. Uh, at the same time, uh, and again, I, I couldn't have imagined all this. I'm talking to Martha. Uh, I'm talking to Ellis, uh, Allison. Uh, at the same time, uh, the gentleman in the photograph there is a, he says he's retired, but he just sent me an email and said he's off uh, again for another assignment. That's uh, Air Force Major Mike J. Wright. Um, and Mike, what he does right now, I, think, I don't think this is classified, but he teaches the, uh, the pilots to fly the drones. Uh, that's how good Mike is. But Mike lives in Northern Hills, and he called and said that, you see, he's walking on a path there. Uh, Mike called and said that uh, he's lived in Northern Hills long enough that um, he walked his children to school. And he kept walking along that path, and you see all that overgrowth. He said he kept seeing this overgrown lot. And being a good civic uh, citizen, he said, we need to find a way to clean that up or call the owner and get something done. Um, and so Mike started doing research. And he went down to the Bear County Spanish Archives, uh, met Dr. David Carlson, Dr. Carlson helped him with some research, and they, they actually found the deed to that land. Turns out that that property was owned by a former uh, black slave. Her name was Jane Warren. Uh, Jane was emancipated. We believe she was emancipated in Comal County, uh, just across the Cibolo Creek. We don't know how she got her money, but by 1870, Jane had bought 50 acres of land uh, in what is now Northern Hills. And out of that 50 acres, she dedicated 1.26 acres as a colored, it's in the deed, as a colored cemetery. All right, so Mike finds this, he finds this deed, he, he starts calling, trying to track down some of Jane's heirs. Um, I, I have to tell you this, this side story so that you can see how, um, how crazy the world is that we live in. Um, so Jane, they buy the land, uh, legal purchase, and as Jane go, gets over in age, she begins to subdivide the land for her sons and uh, uh, grandchildren. And um, uh, the last living descendant of Jane lived on that land in 1975. Uh, her name was Easter Clay. They called her Aunt Easter. Um, and so when Aunt Easter passed on, um, all the property records and all the responsibility went to those heirs. But the city, city of San Antonio and Bear County, didn't know that that 1.26 acres was a cemetery. So they began to send tax bills to the, to, to the this is true, to the heirs. And that's, of course, that scared them. And uh, uh, not having any real real estate experience, they just kept putting the tax bills in the drawer, and every year the penalties would go up. So when Mike met me, he said, I'm an amateur historian. I don't know what to do next. And as you heard in the uh, introduction, uh, Martha explained, I served six years on the City of San Antonio Historic and Design Commission. And I said, Mike, I know what to do. <laughs> so we, we took the deed, uh, we took the, uh, the partition, um, uh, uh, the airship uh, documents, and went to the Office of Historic Preservation. And I convinced Kay Hines, who, are, who is our city archaeologist, to go out there where all that brush is and show her that the cemetery was there. 
And then Kay immediately picked up the phone and called Bear County Tax Assessor and said, burn those tax bills. So <laughs> that's how we got rid of the tax bills. Um, but we continued to research and uh, that slide right there, you can see that's a 1939 aerial. Uh, we got that aerial from the Tobin aerial collection here in San Antonio. And you can see, you can see the farm buildings, you can see the layout. And there's the cemetery. So now we've got the plats, we've got the deed records, and we've got this aerial uh, that verifies. And so what we've been able to do is clear the brush from the cemetery. Unfortunately, it's been vandalized. So the headstones are not in place. Uh, but we do, we have death certificates, we have oral histories uh, from folks that remember burying their relatives there, so we know that there are, there are human remains. Um, and then the story really got interesting as we got the brush cleared. See that brown area there? Um, and, and Major Mike was out there, he's been out there with us every step of the way with his machete and his chainsaw. And we, we cut our way to that back fence, and the fence line looked kind of funny. And um, so we, we got a drone photograph flown, and you could see that something was out of whack. Um, and just this past week, we were able to get uh, results. We got a registered Texas land surveyor, and he documented the boundaries. And that brown area is an encroachment of 6,064 square feet into the cemetery. In other words, the neighbors to the south have moved their fence into the cemetery. So the descendants that are living, now we're gonna work to get that land back because there might be human remains there. Um, and so this is gonna be an exercise, not just uh, for us individually, but a, a lesson for the city of San Antonio because we have Martha's Family Cemetery, We've got uh, the McCulloch Cemetery, for example, and now we've got the, uh, this is called the Hockley Cemetery, and it's actually related to two others uh, within the area. Uh, there are many more across the city, and uh, these are historic resources that we all need to take care of and uh, that all enrich our culture and, and our history. In the process of doing the research for the Hockley Cemetery, um, my granddad, um, believe it or not, I, all these cliches, my granddad was a cowboy um, in Nacogdoches County, Texas. And he had a cattle brand. And I got curious and I said, I wonder if any of these folks had a cattle brand. So we started doing research and sure enough, uh, the YOK, that's Jane Warren's cattle brand. Okay, so we started. I started doing research. So from eight, the first African American cattle brand that we've been able to find is Samuel McCulloch. He filed his brand in the Bear County Spanish Archives in 1852. After 1865, now we're up to 72 African American cattle brands filed in Bear County. Only four of those 72 are women. Jane's is one of those women. So that means that African Americans were involved in ranching, cattle raising, um, stock production, uh, et cetera, and we're working to see what we can find out about their agricultural pursuits. Um, so that leads us back to First Presbyterian Church. So I'm connecting these different dots. Samuel McCulloch lives in the same neighborhood um, as the Asa Mitchells. Um, I'm finding black settlements all over the county, not just on the east side, but all over Bear County. So I go back to Martha, and I said, Martha, do you think your, your cousins and your aunts would let us do an oral interview? And she said, well, I don't know. We'd have to, we'd have to ask. And so Martha's been very good negotiating uh, with her family. We were able to uh, convince her Aunt Julia and her uh, cousin Julia and Helen, who was the little girl in the photograph that uh, she showed you. And 
when we had the interview, um, it was recorded, each of the ladies had a stack of documents. And Martha's just showed you, like they say, the tip of the iceberg of what she has. But her Aunt Julia, in the conversation, said, she said, you know, I have in this um, scrapbook um, information that says Grandpa Asa helped start the first colored Sunday school in Bear County. And I said, Julia, how do you know? And she said, well, it, it's in the vault. <laughs> and I said, you're kidding. And I said, what vault? And she said, at First Presbyterian Church. So Martha and Aunt Julia were good enough to call Mr. Cogburn and arrange for us to actually come down and look in the vault. And sure enough, um, your session minutes, this is one of the pages out of the session minutes, describes in 1856 uh, the baptism of a number of African American members of the church, and it gives their first and last names. First and last names. This is before 1865. Uh, so Dr. Phyllis and I came. Uh, we also, the photograph at the bottom left there, uh, we also convinced A&M to let us go because uh, Julia Carlson said she thought she could lead us to the cemetery and show us where the slaves were buried. And <laughs> we joke about this, but Julia's 96? Yes. 96 and she still drives. <laughs> and still drives. So we go to the get A&M to allow us out there. They, that, that's an armed policeman. He escorted us. No GPS, no map. We're just following the fence lines and the cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, which way is the sun falling. And Julia, <laughs> Julia leads us to the Asa Mitchell Cemetery. And then she, I said, Julia, where are the slaves? And she said, oh, they're right over here. And I said, how do you know? And she said, well, when I was a girl, we used to play out here at the cemetery, uh, me and my cousin or my sister Mildred, and then she begins to describe how the graves are decorated. Okay, how the graves are decorated with broken pottery, chips of glass, colored glass, etc. So now we're really on to something. Um, and here we are, there's Dr. Phyllis, Mr. Cogburn and Martha, and we're, we're literally looking through and we're so grateful for uh, the cooperation and the patience to allow us to look through. Um, and as we look through, uh, we discovered that by 1860, First Presbyterian has elected three colored elders. One of them, his name is William Reed. So we, Dr. Phyllis and I assigned uh, the intern, find out as much as you can about William. So this was supposed to be Mariah's part, and I'll, I'll kind of roll through it. Um, and so she was gonna tell you how we started, that the first Presbyterian members list, the session notes, we went to Ancestry, we went to newspapers.com, we went to the San Antonio Express News, um, and, the, and the libraries, and then Phyllis is gonna tell you about this connection that we found to other names on a school petition list. Um, Difficulties, the, the presence in the newspapers is spotty. Uh, some of the records are limited. Folks' names change. Um, a lot of times back then, the, uh, the scribes, the clerks that would write in the names would write or spell them phonetically. They, they wouldn't spell them, uh, you know, a proper spelling the way we would spell today. So then you have to work that out. Uh, relocation, and then the last thing that Mariah was going to tell you is that the documents were difficult to read. You saw that photograph of the session notes, they're in longhand. And so we're teaching uh, a 19, 20 year old, don't, don't look at block text on a computer, you've got to learn how to read cursive longhand writing. And so uh, Mariah's gotten to be quite an expert uh, at that. Um, and so again, what we found is that uh, William was an elder at First Presbyterian Church. Uh, he was a resident of Bear County. There's his name in your session minutes, April 6, 1856. And it indicates that he was received into First Presbyterian Church. And that's when it was in the old adobe, okay? Um, and then in um, 1856, it says that Reed has children. It names his daughters, the, their names and their ages. 
Uh, then we find in 1867, William's name shows up on the Bear County voters roll. So he has civic interest, not just passive uh, interest, he has civic interest. He's among the first black men registered to vote in Bear County. Um, then we find these two newspaper articles, uh, and I laugh at them because uh, the one at the left, 1884, it says that Uncle William is in very, very poor health. This is the San Antonio Light newspaper. He's in very poor health, and the at writer, the reporter, asks for everyone to pray for his um, uh, recovery and uh, uh, goodwill. Um, and so we, we, Dr. Phyllis and Mariah and I wrestled for quite some time trying to figure out, well, what happened to William after that? Uh, we couldn't find a death uh, record. We couldn't find anything else. And then eventually, I guess a few months ago actually, uh, this article on the right appears, uh, 1889, and I laughed when I gave it to Martha. If you can read at the top, it says, the last of the Mohegans. <laughs> and so William, has pa he passes in 1889, but the big eulogy for William was given by the pastor of First Presbyterian Church. Okay, so that means he, he and those members had special places, special connections, long-lasting, deep relationships. Um, and so we continue to look for what happened to them, what other churches did they join, what other civic activities did they get into. Um, and so Mariah starts to make uh, the simple charts, the simple genealogy charts, uh, the names of the siblings, and uh, when did they marry. Uh, there it is, there's the marriage certificate. Uh, when did they marry, and even the names, the witness names are important on the marriage certificates. That lets you know uh, who they are, uh, who they were related to. Uh, and then there's the photograph. Uh, that's Julia uh, there at the top left during an oral interview. Uh, that that uh, uh, land document is the document uh, for the Asa Mitchell property uh, in South Bear County. And there are the Mitchell descendants. We're at the cemetery. Uh, that was the day that Julia showed us where the slaves were buried, and uh, we looked at the other, uh, the other graves. Um, and then there's the photograph, I think Martha passed it around, of uh, Burl Ross. And uh, one of the things she might not have told you um, is that because Burl lived to be 106, he lived to be 106, that means that Julia knew Burl. Okay. So we got to do an oral interview with one of your members who knew Burl Ross. And Julia's daughter, Helen, knew Burl. So we've got first, you'd have to say, first-hand knowledge of Burl and uh, his activities. He worked as a, a ranch hand, a farm hand, a cowboy in South Bear County. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Phyllis, and she's going to tie another uh, thread to this. Uh, for you, and then I'll come back um, and uh, wrap up. And by the way, that photograph at the bottom right, that's the, the ranch house in its peak or heyday. Uh, and you can see it was two stories. And um, Julia called Martha, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, and said that she had found, Julia had found uh, an, an old fashioned, today we'd say old fashioned cassette tape. and. Uh, so we're, now we're really friends. She says, call Everett and tell him I want, to, want him to hear this tape. And so we got Julia, um, we actually went to a recording lab and sat down so we could make a digital copy. And in that tape, uh, Julia is talking to her mother, uh, Julia Mowerman, uh, Mrs. Gus B. Mowerman, the former mayor of San Antonio. And they start talking about the ranch. And she explains that Ace's slaves were not just field hands, that they were trained carpenters, trained masons, and blacksmiths, and that they helped Asa build the core of that house. So now we have not just field hands, but we have artisans and craftsmen connected to um, Asa Mitchell. And it also says in the interview that Asa hired those craftsmen out to other neighboring landowners. So now we don't know who all they helped to build and construct and uh, develop in San Antonio, but we know that they were active. Okay, 
Dr. Phyllis. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about another project that uh, Everett and I and Mariah, our student intern, have been working on. Um, but just a little bit of background before I get started. The Civil War ended in 1865, and then the 12 years after, from 1865 to 1877, is known as Reconstruction, because that's the era when um, the federal government and local state governments as well are trying to figure out how do we put the nation back together? And in order to do that, there's two questions on everyone's mind. And of course, no one can agree on how to answer those questions, but it's basically the same question. One is how do we make the South productive again without the use of slave labor? And two, what do we do with the emancipated, the former slaves, right? The freedmen and women. There's three and a half million individuals that now we have to figure out what to do with them. And again, no one can agree on how to answer that question, those two questions, but those are the two main questions. Um, so one of the things that the Republicans uh, at the federal government level do is they create the uh, Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, right? which is an organization that was more commonly known as the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, so the Freedmen's Bureau then, they negotiated contracts between the white landowners and the former slaves. They um, helped former slaves um, do things like get married and have formal wedding ceremonies and things of that nature. But for our purposes here, one of the other things that they did was create schools for black children uh, in the South. And they supported African Americans who created their own schools. So you might have these black communities that found their own schools, and then they received some sort of financial help or support from the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, so in 1870, there were 56 schools in Texas that African Americans opened on their own, that opened themselves. And the Bureau, uh, the Freedmen's Bureau, assisted 34 of these schools. Um, so oftentimes, the Bureau would create the curriculum and gather these instructional materials and then give them to these African-American schools. Um, and of course, the curriculum was very much focused on vocational training, right? Uh, giving them, trying to teach them skills that's going to help them integrate themselves into this labor market of the era. So in March of 1866, uh, the Freedmen's Bureau opened up a school here in San Antonio. Uh, it was called the Lincoln School, and they housed it at the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, which also opened that same year in 1866. So after 1865, in this Reconstruction era, when you have African Americans trying to figure out how they are going to incorporate themselves into uh, United States society, they begin creating their own black churches. So from 1866 to the early 1870s, there are a number of black churches that emerge here in San Antonio. So there's one called the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, and that's where the Freedmen's Bureau School, called the Lincoln School, was housed. Um, so this Lincoln School, this, this uh, Bureau School, it had day classes, and it had night classes. Um, it had some trouble hiring teachers, actually, when it first got started. Um, and eventually, they ended up hiring white women to work there. Oftentimes, there were white women who moved down from the north, moved to the south, for the specific purpose of teaching in these schools. Uh, these women often worked as teachers in the north somewhere. And so the school was controversial for a number of reasons. Um, one of the main reasons was that you had white teachers teaching black pupils. And opponents of this Reconstruction era, um, they claimed that that situation was promoting racial integration, that it was promoting racial equality, and that's something that they were not in favor of. Um, Additionally, additionally, opponents to these bureau schools argued that these northern teachers, right, these women who were coming down from the north were Republicans, and the south in this era was strongly Democrats. And it was this idea that these Republican teachers were inculcating these black children with 
this Republican mindset and uh, radicalizing the black population, so to speak. Um, so as a result, what ends up happening is the city council, uh, because back then there weren't there wasn't like a San Antonio independent school district in this particular era. The schools that existed were under the, the purview of the San Antonio City Council. So because of all this controversy surrounding the Lincoln School then, the San Antonio City Council creates the first, black, uh, the first school for black children. Uh, and they call that the Rincon School. So there we go. They call that the Rincon School. Um, that opened in 1871, and it had, when it first opened, it had between 100 and 170 students. Um, there were some members who, some uh, members of the African American community who were kind of intimidated to, to leave the Lincoln School in favor of the Rincon School, and so uh, before long, the Lincoln School just closed because the student population there declined rather sharply. And so you'll see here the city council minutes from April 11th of 1887. Uh, His Honor the Mayor stated that at the last meeting of the school board, the committee had uh, recommended the appropriation of $4,000 additional for a school building for colored children in ward number three. The resolution of the school committee was read and on motion of the alderman um, Cater was referred to the finance committee, right? Um, this is the, a document that's found in the San Antonio Municipal Archives. So this here notes that this is evidence that the city council was aware of overcrowding that was taking place in the Rincon School, right? That there were too many children who were attending, not enough seats. And so they agreed that they were going to appropriate $4,000 to build a new school for black children. Um, but they did not follow through with this. They did, this was 1887. They did not, they said they were gonna do it, but then they didn't follow through with it. So in September of that same year, you had 45 members of the black community in San Antonio. They got together, they wrote a petition, uh, and they submitted it to the city council. And in this petition, they state, uh, they resolved that a recent period, the city council did make an appropriation of $4,000 for the erection of a school building for the accommodation and benefit of colored pupils. And moreover, as the present and crowded condition of the existing colored public schools urgently demands the name of, uh, of their sanitation and their more successful conduct, that this object be realized prompt, promptly. Um, so they were aware, the black community was aware that the city council had passed this resolution that they were gonna appropriate $4,000 to build a new school and that they hadn't followed through. So they submitted this petition. Also, the city council, if, when you look in the city council minutes, they note this petition. So they did receive it. Uh, this document, by the way, is from the um, Texas State Archives in Austin, the Department of Education um, uh, files that are there up in the state archive. So a year later, <laughs> the city council still has not done anything. They received the petition, they made note of the petition, but they still haven't built a new school for black children. So eight of those 45 people, those 45 individuals who signed that initial petition, eight of them write a letter to the state superintendent of public instruction, a guy named Oster, Oscar Cooper, who's up in Austin. So they send Superintendent Cooper a copy of their petition plus an additional letter. Um, and in their letter, they state that there are 1,805 black children in the city, but that the Rincon School, which was the only school for black children, uh, the Rincon School only had 470 seats. Uh, they detailed how many children were turned away uh, every morning because there was nowhere to put them, like there was literally nowhere to put them. Uh, they also stated that there were more children sitting on the floor and standing in the back than there were actually children sitting in seats. So when they say uh, overcrowding of the Rincon School, they meant it. it. It's not that just there weren't enough chairs, it's that there was literally not enough space in the classrooms. Um, 
And something of interest to note is that they sent their letter to Superintendent Cooper uh, on letterhead of Lewis and Carr, which was a white law firm here in San Antonio. And a few weeks after those eight individuals submitted their letter to Superintendent Cooper up in Austin, uh, Lewis and Carr themselves wrote a letter to Superintendent Cooper stating that these black citizens were, quote, among the best colored citizens in San Antonio, like essentially vouching for them, right? Saying that they're upstanding citizens, please take their, uh, please take their concerns seriously. And this is a map that our student intern, who unfortunately could not be here, as Everett mentioned earlier, Mariah Torres made. So she took um, the names, the 45 names of those original petition signers and looked, up, looked them up in historic city directories and plotted their addresses on a map, uh, an 18... 85 Sanborn map of the city. So you can see by looking at all those dots that these 45 um, activists, we could call them, right, educational activists, did not all live on the east side. They lived throughout the city on both uh, east and west of the river. So what does Superintendent uh, Cooper do as a response? Um, in September of 1888, Superintendent Cooper wrote a letter to the city council saying, essentially asking them what's going on, right? Like, why is it that I'm receiving this, this letter from, uh, from these black citizens? And so the city council responded that there were enough seats for the children who showed up. <laughs> so they were essentially saying, yes, there are 1,805 black children in the city, but they don't all try to come to school. Then they said that they had enacted a new policy that would no longer turn students away in the morning just because there wasn't enough room. They also said that they were going to break up the school day. Um, that, so instead of the school day being from 8 to 3, they were going to have like 8 to 12 or 8 to 11.30, and that will be one school day. And then the school will open back up again from like 12.30 to 3 or some, something like that. So there would be two different sessions so that they could offer instruction to twice the number of students. And then they also said um, that they were going to rent out a room in the St. James AME Church, which was located west of San Pedro Creek, so that they could provide even more instructional space to black children. And so this is a photo of the city council minutes that makes note of this. So it states, the committee reported that they had rented rooms from the AME Church for the Colored Children's School across San Pedro Creek at the rate of $15 per month. So the city council was gonna pay the church $15 per month to pay for the cost of renting out the space. That they had uh, employed a teacher. The teacher earned $35 a month. And they employed um, someone to work as a janitor, and the janitor earned $5 a month. So the city council was noting that this was going to cost the city $55 a month to, um, to maintain that school. And so this last slide here. Um, in 1879, so this is a little bit earlier than the petitioner's list that we were just discussing, the city built a high school for white children, and um, many African Americans responded that there was no high school for African Americans in the city, and they wanted one. That was part of their demands. But it wasn't until 1889 that uh, George Brackenridge provided funding and materials to enhance the curriculum at the Rincon School to include high school instruction. So they weren't, they didn't build a separate high school. Uh, they just um, added this additional these in additional instructional materials to the black school that already existed. Um, in 1881, um, the school was renamed from Rincon to Riverside. It was renamed to Riverside. And in 1915, it was renamed again the Frederick Douglass Colored High School. And it moved to an eight-room building across the street from Mount Zion First Baptist Church on the east side. And then this is a page from the graduate program uh, for the Douglas Senior School from 1931. And so you'll see that students receive certificates in toilet, si toilet science, domestic art, domestic science, and vocational training. So thank you all very much.
So as we've been connecting these dots, I kept making a map. And the, I kept making a map. And this is a summary of that map. This is Bear County, uh, as you can see. Uh, the red dots in the middle uh, represent those dots that um, our intern Mariah found east and west of the river. But the kind of purple dots on the perimeter, those were black settlements. In other words, rural communities of African Americans, like the Hockleys, um, like the community that developed around Samuel McCulloch, and they're all over the county. They're not just on the east side, they're northwest quadrant, northeast quadrant, southwest, and southeast. So we've kind of broken the myth uh, in the process of doing this work. And the result is the San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum. Um, it's a 501c3 organization. Uh, there are some SACAM volunteers. You want to raise your hand? There they are, SACAM volunteers uh, here with us. Um, we took that photograph, I guess, about a year and a half ago. Uh, many of you might know this house but not recognize the history. Uh, that building is at 430 North Cherry. Uh, that is the homestead of Samuel J. Sutton. Uh, many of you have heard of G.J. Sutton. Samuel was G.J.'s father, okay? Um, I was talking to someone earlier. Um, in the old days, the building permits uh, were published in the newspaper. So we found um, an 1894 newspaper that said that Samuel, you're looking at the photograph, the left side of that uh, building, Samuel built in 1894 for $550 and began uh, his family uh, homestead there. He married uh, Lillian Smith Sutton, and they had 13 children, and he raised them in that house. Uh, Samuel was one of the first, you heard Phyllis talk about the schools, he was one of the first colored school teachers um, in San Antonio. He, he actually came from Richmond, Virginia, uh, via Mexico to San Antonio. Uh, he was very civically minded, and so Samuel, um, and Miss Lillian hosted many civic events uh, at their house. Um, you also probably have heard of Percy Sutton, uh, the uh, politician that made his name in New York and bought the Apollo Theater. Percy was the son of Samuel and Lillian. Percy and G.J., of course, are buried here in Bear County. Um, and so Mr. George Frederick acquired that property uh, basically for taxes and has been working with us, uh, San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum, to use that house as our um, headquarters and focus. The right part of that house um, is the funeral home part that G.J. Sutton and A.C. Sutton used to run what they call the Sutton Paradise Funeral Home. Um, A.C., some of you may have known him. I had the privilege to know him. Uh, his name was Alexander Carver Sutton. He was the godson of, of George Washington Carver. So when Dr. Carver came to San Antonio to give um, commencement speeches, he was not allowed to stay at the gutter or the St. Anthony because he was black. So he stayed at that house. Uh, Dr. Booker T. Washington gave three speeches, the noted um, uh, principal and educator of Tuskegee Institute. Uh, Dr. Washington gave three speeches in San Antonio in 1911. He was not allowed to stay at the Minger or the Gunter or whatever. He stayed at that house. Uh, when G.J. came along, G.J. Sutton came along uh, in the Civil Rights Movement, uh, uh, there was a, a, a young a, a attorney. Um, I just went blank. You'll, you'll come back. There was a young attorney. Um, uh, his name was Thurgood Marshall, uh, who represented the NAACP. And he met with G.J. in that house. So there's an enormous history related to that 430 Cherry. And um, Mr. Uh, Frederick has been good enough in the Hope House Ministry um, to work with us to do that. So the posters that you see here and here um, are just a part of an exhibit that, or a set of exhibits uh, that we've assembled and uh, we're working wherever we can to collect this authentic history, 
uh, interpret it, uh, but also make it accessible and available. We've been conducting oral histories. Um, we've been scanning records and documents like uh, Martha's documents and uh, Mr. Cogburn was, <laughs> we have a whole set of the First Presbyterian session minutes and Mariah knows them front and back. Uh, they're priceless. Um, and it's just been amazing how interconnected we are um, in San Antonio. I mean, we really are a diverse community and there's many opportunities uh, for all ages, all persuasions of uh, people to share um, and engage this history. Um, so that concludes our presentation. Um, I hope we have a few minutes for some questions and answers. And I wanna thank you for your uh, attention. I mean, you've really been with us uh, through the whole presentation, and it's just been an honor to uh, be able to do this uh, presentation for you. Uh, so, questions. I just want to say a plug. When several put, people put a lot of effort into preserving our documents and having an archive that other people could research, I feel like going, yay! because now it is preserved in a safe place that other people can see the connectivity. I wanted to ask about the slide where when you discovered the cemetery and then found that there had been an encroachment, there are laws that kind of almost allow that, but not into cemeteries. So has there been something built on that encroached property that complicates the issue of regaining, regaining that for the cemetery? Uh, sure, some of you might know uh, Texas has cemetery law, state cemetery law, and it says that once you bury one human set of remains, it's a cemetery in perpetuity. There's a whole civil process that you can go through to have it, uh, they call it dededicated, but it's very complex. And in addition, um, if you if you dededicate the cemetery and you say, we're gonna remove the remains, now you're into forensics, for forensic science. And so you have to be able to prove that you can, you're gonna carefully remove the remains and then reinter them. So you have to have a set of disinterment permits and a set of reinterment permits. In this particular case, we have living heirs for the Hockley family and they have no record of selling that land or giving permission for that encroachment. And there is, um, it may, may, this may be the bad news for the landowner, as you're asking, he's, they've built an outbuilding uh, shed and it's modern construction. It's got sheathing and mm -hmm. a, a, a composition roof. It's 25 feet into the cemetery. So now you're into, here I am, architect, right? Where's the building permit? Where's your, where's your authorization to, to do that? So that's gonna work against the folks that. Well, that's one of those things that will be legally worked out, hopefully. Hopefully. I'm yeah. thinking about all over Texas, where, where I have lines of my family that go back to those early dates as well. And those little private cemeteries that are scattered all over this state, and many of them not acknowledged officially. They're known locally, but there's not any kind of designation for them that are being allowed to uh, be pasture for animals and, and other kinds of things which destroy tombstones and this kind of thing. It is an ongoing process. I so appreciate what you're doing because you know there's spillover not just for the African American community, but for our Indian community, our early settlers that were not African American, to find those roots, establish those places. So thank you. Thank you. Um, the name of, I think it was William Reed. Yes. Um, and, and his name was in the uh, registration. Is there any, um, information about those early black elders um, on their occupations or how long they were members because then I heard that they started forming black churches. So I was just curious how long they were members, any information beyond that. Do you have a better recollection than I do? Or 
I'll start if you want to. Uh, okay, so what we've been able to figure out, um, of course, they were, they were members in 1865. And so Mariah, our intern, that was, that's one of her big projects is to figure out um, after emancipation, where did they live? Um, e even during the time they were members of First Presbyterian, what families were they connected to? Uh, for example, there was uh, one of the African American ladies, her name, last name that she took was Vance. And the Vance uh, family were merchants. They were members of your church. So we're trying to figure out um, did she do some particular work for them that, you know, that was special to their uh, merchant's business, et cetera. Um, so far, we haven't been able to find an occupation for William. Um, and then the, the three elders, uh, not, neither of the, th the three elders, we haven't been able to find occupation, but we have found some land records um, that show purchases. Uh, some of them, believe it or not, were in this proximity, even though First Presbyterian wasn't here at that time, there was a neighborhood just north of here. And so we found some land records there. Um, so if anybody has any clues, uh, I'm serious. We were open to, uh, to them, but that is absolutely one of the things that we're trying to do is kind of trace their evolution and uh, uh, expansion into the broader community. There's, Uh, do you, 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 no, I haven't either. The San Antonio Genealogical Society. So noted. <laughs> There's a lady. Started. Uh, so the question was, uh, the schools that Dr. Phyllis mentioned, um, um, are there any connections to current um, institutions? You, you heard her mention the uh, St. James AME Church. That church is still in operation. There's still a, a, an active congregation. Uh, St. James stayed west of the river uh, and has stayed west of the river through its existence. So St. James AME, uh, it's on Richter Street now, just west of the Bear County uh, Jail. Um, it's still there. Uh, of course, uh, Mount Zion is now on the east side. Second Baptist is on the east side. Uh, those may have been um, uh, uh, forerunners of the, or uh, they came afterward, I'm sorry, after those school churches. But St. James is the only one that's still um, operational that I'm aware of. Anybody else? This is the best part. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Can you tell us a little more about the Archive and Museum? Uh, so the San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum. Um, what would I say? It was like the eye of the storm. Um, when I'm talking to Martha and I'm talking to Allison Elder, um, I came across a businessman here in San Antonio, and he said, there's no black history in San Antonio. And I said, you're crazy. <laughs> and uh, he said, prove it. So I started traveling around or trying to meet around, and um, the response was slow, quite frankly. Um, and I happened to have a friend, uh, uh, you heard in the introduction, I had the great privilege to serve on the, the President's Committee for the Arts and the Humanities. Um, and so that meant I'm working with the chairman at the time, his name was Bill Ferris, the chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, Bill is a distinguished folklore professor uh, now at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, so I got on the phone and I sent, talked to Bill, I said, you know, I'm finding some really amazing things. Uh, Bill also just happens to be uh, an expert in African American blues. Uh, Bill's a tall, uh, wrangly fellow. He happens to be white, but he's an expert 
on African American blues. He was born in Yazoo Delta, Mississippi. Bill helped B.B. Uh, King start his archive before B.B. passed away. And I had the great privilege of seeing Bill and B.B. play spontaneous jazz sessions <laughs> when I was on the President's Committee. So I said, Bill, we're finding some really interesting things. Do you have any ideas? Um, and so he asked me, he said, come to, come to North Carolina, let's sit down and talk. So I went, flew to North Carolina, and he says, you know, I think you're really onto something. Um, and he said, I, I think we can help you because we have at North Carolina what we call the Center for the Study of the American South. And he said, we really mean the whole South, not just Carolina. And so Bill put me in touch with several members of the UNC staff, University of North Carolina staff, and we put together a proposal for what we, what we call digital community archives. In other words, we know that we can't get all the session books like First Presbyterian has, but for example, Mr. Cogburn allowed us to scan them in digital format. Uh, Martha's family has their scrapbooks. We don't want to take Martha's scrapbooks, but she's been good enough to let us scan them and photograph them. And so if we have these digital records, we can overlay them, we can compare them, we can share them, et cetera. And so we wrote a proposal to the Andrew Mellon Foundation in New York, and lo and behold, we got it. And so the Mellon Foundation grant provides the expertise for SACAM to develop and build this, what we're calling digital community archive, which is headquartered at 430 North Cherry. Um, and in the process, we engaged uh, Texas A&M at San Antonio as one of our local partners. Uh, the Kronkowski Charitable Foundation has uh, been an, a wonderful funding source. The San Antonio Conservation Society uh, has helped us. And so we're, we're building uh, this kind of new institution, if you will, uh, in SACAM um, as we go forward. So that's, that's the quick and dirty story of how we got started. The, the Mellon grant uh, was a three-year grant. We're in the heading towards the, we're finishing the second year of the three-year grant. Uh, UNC has sent uh, archivists here to work with us and train the friends. Some of them, as I said, you can see them here. Uh, they've sent um, oral historians here to show us how to do oral histories. Uh, they've sent the videographers here to show us and help us how to do that. And they're still working with us to organize this collection of information. I've lost track now. We, somebody said the other day we have about 1,000 uh, digital records now uh, in the SACAM uh, collection. It, it is because, <laughs> so those of you who would know, and I'll, no, so the, she, she asked the question, she asked the question, is the YOK brand still in existence? So, so I have to, this has been an education for me. So I go to the Spanish archives and start talking to Dr. Carlson and asking him the same question, you know, how does this work? So in Texas, when you uh, register a brand, it's yours for 10 years. And then after that 10 years, you have to go back and re-register. If you don't, someone else can come along and claim your brand. Uh, Jane's brand was filed in 1875. It's been sitting there until two years ago when I showed up at the Spanish archives and I asked them who has the claim on this brand. And they said, no one. And I said, I'm gonna claim it. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna claim it, and the other 72 that I mentioned, I have claimed them, so that that collection will become part of the SACAM archive. Uh, the <laughs> so, and then we got to thinking, or uh, you know, I got to thinking. I said, what could I do to kind of get some of the young folks involved? And you know, they wear caps. Some of them, you know, they turn them around, and, but I'm, I'm old, I wear mine straight. And so I said, you know, this would be, maybe this is an idea that, you know, we could put these brands on a cap and start to get folks uh, uh, interested. And so we did that. This was, YOK was the first one, and the first day I wore it, 
um, I went into a food establishment somewhere and the cashier said, what's that funny symbol on your cap? And the door was open. You know, the opportunity for me to tell her the story of Jane and the YOK brand and something she didn't know. And she said, oh, this is really great. So that's what we're, <laughs> that's what we're doing. It's, uh, you know how they call it uh, intangible history? You know, how do you make a connection with something that somebody can't see? Well, now you can see it. Thank you so much. One uh, last question. It's not actually a question. Because we're all waiting to eat. Yes. Not kidding. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. When I offered to give our history of the church books, everybody already had them. Uh, and I asked if there was any kind of honorarium. And what I was told was there's information on, let me get it right, the San Antonio African American Community Archive Museum on every table. If you want to do something in appreciation for Everett and everyone being here with us today, uh, take a look at the brochure. There's a website. I'm sure there's places if you would feel inclined to make a donation, uh, then, then there's, there's one of these, at, several of these at each table. So uh, just want to make you aware of that. And then just a housekeeping item. Uh, we have 50 people here for lunch. So make sure when you sit at a table, sit at a table that has a salad and a dessert, uh, because we, that's, that's what, we, what we have set out. But there are 10 other lunches available. So if, and this is how it goes. We have 55 people sign up. We order 60 lunches. We have 50 people show up. And then we have some extra food. We have to pay for that. Uh, so we would love for you if you, were, were here and hadn't signed up for lunch, then you can't get a $10 lunch like this anywhere in town on your way home. Uh, blackened catfish on rice with, I don't know the whole menu, but um, it doesn't get any better than this for $10. So if you are inclined to stay, you can see Jane and Karen at the table. If you want to take one of those 10 lunches home with you for dinner, uh, we can pack it up and send it with you just so that we can, that's just one housekeeping piece that, um, you know, we, we wanted to invite you to stay for lunch or take one home with you. And uh, you can take care of that with Karen and Jane at the table. Another interesting, um, Charianne brought me a newsletter from 19... There's a date on here somewhere. 1998, and here is the advertisement. Delbert Rowland, Director of Senior Adult Ministries, is planning a day trip to College Station to tour the A&M campus and the Bush Library. Lunch and motor coat transportation included. Price is $47. We can't match that price, but I think we're offering a little bit more, and uh, hope that you'll sign up for that. Allow me to pray, and we'll join together for our lunch. Father, thank you for the information that we have learned today, for, for the his, history that uh, ties our church into some rich history of San Antonio, for folks that, that are diligent to find that and search it out and document it. Thank you for what we have learned today. Pray that you'll be with us as we fellowship together around this table's and thank you for the food and for those who prepared it for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you go to your table, there is Bridge in the library and Mahjong in the Geneva room uh, following lunch. 
Thanks for being here.